You set foot on foreign soil. Only this land isn't ruled by any country or government. In this land we celebrate music. In this land we celebrate games. In this land we celebrate those who compose video game music. Welcome to the VG Embassy. Embassy. Welcome and thanks for tuning in to another episode of the VG Embassy. This is a show centered around video game music and the amazing online community of fans and podcasters that enjoy it. My name's Ed, and on each episode I'll take the role of Prime VGM Minister and invite a guest VG Ambassador onto the show to share with us their own video game music culture. Or, I may share a part of my culture on a solo show. And this is episode 52 Boys and girls, we're officially at one episode per week for an entire year, if you chose to listen to the show that way. Um, I don't know, that's kind of a random thing to say, but we are discussing a fantasy console today with a great fan and purveyor of this fantasy console. Third time VG Ambassador, Mr. Ben the Dyad Dishman. Welcome back to the show, sir. How are you tonight? Aloha. I'm doing... I'm doing fine. I'm doing my my spirits are are lifted simply being in in this recording presence. That is very humbling, sir. Thank you. I was a great fan of your shows when they were regular, and now that they are constipated, hopefully <laughs> we will get some podcast laxative up in there yeah. at some point. Uh, but for now, I am happy to have you on the show and uh, sharing your thoughts with us today on the Pico Eight. So. Uh, I went and did a little research because we, you know, we chat a lot on Discord, most of the mm-hmm. people in the VG Embassy community, and I have a little subsection on my Discord server for VG Ambassador requests, theme requests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the very first request I ever got on this request channel was on November 30th, 2018, <laughs> and the dyad wrote, I have an idea for a show, Pico 8 themed. And so now... Was it like almost 18 months later? Here we yeah. are. Yeah. <laughs> Finally doing the show. Making your way down the list. Yeah. So so how did you get introduced to the Pico 8? Because I think you're the one that actually introduced me to it. Yeah, I was um I was trying to think about that earlier. Um so the company that makes Pico 8, Lex Lexoffel. 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 Yeah. I got a one of their other games in an either Humble Bundle or some sort of service like that. And I think it's called Voxatron, mm-hmm. which is a voxel-based game, which, for those who don't know, are 3D pixels, I guess is the easiest way of thinking like about Minecraft it. Minecraft is the best way, I think, to... Yeah, yeah, that's a much better way. Although I think Minecraft is more bulky. Right. Generally, when I think of voxels, I think of more compact, more detail. But yes, Minecraft is probably the be-all, end-all for voxels. I think it just stands for volumetric pixels. So yes. you can imagine pixels in 3D, that's... That's yeah. what voxels are. Yeah. And included with the Voxatron game was a either a free copy or a vastly reduced priced copy of Pico 8. And, um, you know, it was just kind of the sort of thing that I'm interested in just poking around in. And as I'm sure we will discuss later, there's this robust community of people who just churn out basically free games for you to play on Pico 8. Mm. And so it was... Uh, well worth my time and runs on basically anything. You can play it on your phone, you can play it on a browser, whatever, whatever. So I just became familiar with it from there. Cool. Uh, yeah, it's it's so they call a fantasy console. And a fantasy console is like a regular console without the inconvenience of actual hardware. So the Pico 8 has everything else that makes a console a console. It's got machine specifications, its own display format, its own development tools, its own design culture and distribution platform. It's got a community and players. It's kind of similar to a retro game emulator, but for a machine that really never existed. Right. So the design and the specifications of the Pico 8 were designed from scratch. And they wanted to produce something that feels 
like its own individual thing. Like you can tell that they're video games and it's a video game system, but they didn't want it to be like, oh, this looks like it might be a Nintendo game, or oh, this might be a Game Boy Color game, or oh, this might be a Genesis game. They really wanted to kind of develop a screen resolution, a, a palette, a, a, a method of programming that really feels unique to the console. And I think they did a really good job with that. I, I agree. I think uh, one thing you didn't directly mention, but sort of talked a bit about is the restrictions that are sort of built into the system. And mm. with that comes very deliberate choice and be that from a development perspective or the actual development of Pico 8 itself. Like for instance, you mentioned how the colors are, I don't know, actually, did you mention this? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe I'm going on my own tangent here, but I said it has its own kind of unique palette. Exactly. Okay. So that's, that's what triggered something in my brain is there's the 16 color palette limit, but you know, they had any 16 colors under the sun and from a very deliberate choice of what 16 colors, if I could only have 16, how can I get the most bang for my buck? And the choices they made, I think, are from like an art perspective, are really smart, really wise. You can do a lot with those 16 colors, and they really work and complement each other very, very well. Yeah, every every game really looks very unique, and especially with a limited color palette to choose from, having every game be so kind of uniquely recognizable is, is quite a feat, I think, especially with those limitations. Right. So from a, from a user standpoint, before we get into like the more technical specifications about the Pico 8, you can play it in one of two ways on, on multiple devices. You can just go right into a web browser and you can go to the Pico 8 website and you can launch the Pico 8 from within your web browser. You can even use a controller to control it in your web browser, which is really cool. And then from there, you can visit different games web pages and play the games. You can use a browser that's actually within the fantasy console itself to search for games and to look at featured games, etc., etc. So it's really, really easy to just kind of show up for your first time and have thousands of games at your fingertips. But that also creates a problem because finding which games are actually worth playing and which ones are kind of pushing the hardware to its limits becomes mm -hmm. more difficult mm -hmm. because there's just so many games coming out every single day. So how do you go about finding good games? Like, how did you go about finding good games for this show, Ben? Well, <clears throat> thankfully, Pico 8 puts together a uh, featured list of games and they've been doing it and updating it over time. So since the birth of the system, so you can go back for, you know, two, three years worth of featured games and you'll have 50, hundred games that are all vetted to some degree or another from the programmers. And they're all almost without exception, very, very solid games from there. Once you run out of playing those 100 games, you can just like kind of sort by new and you can sort of get an idea by how much traffic there is because it's, it's almost like a forum post. Yeah. If you're going on the through the website and you can get a sense of what's being, you know, upvoted, commented on, that sort of thing. Uh, you can also follow certain game devs and see what they're turning out. You know, you can't go wrong with the featured games. You'll be playing that for hours and hours. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, you know, having the developers and the artists and the musicians linked on their uh, credit pages along with the games. So that's that's kind of what I was doing, more or less, is kind of following rabbit trails of, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I like this game from this person. Let's see what else they've put out. And, oh, this is a recommended game based on this game that I followed. So I just, you know, almost like a Wikipedia kind of thing. You just kind of go down the rabbit hole, and pretty soon you're so far removed from the original game, you don't even know how you got there. Right. Um, but, but that's just how deep this library is, is that you can do this and never find your way back to point A yeah. again. Yeah. and still be entertained all the way through. And just to give the people who are not familiar with anything on the Pico 8 sort of a sense of what you can expect, uh, the game Celeste, which is now fairly popular, started out as a Pico 8 game. That's right. Um, and then it was it was so successful. I mean, you know, as successful as you can be on a free platform, but it got enough notoriety that they decided to flesh it out into a full game, and obviously it took off from there. So there's not... This is not... Um, it's not Babby's first video game. <laughs> there is that. There's people learning. Yeah. And from, from my experience, it's been like a pretty helpful uh, community, but there's some really polished work that people are just offering up for 
enjoyment. Yeah, there's some legitimate titles on this, and people have gotten some recognition for these titles as well. And speaking of which, in the show notes uh, for this show, we're going to have links to every single game that we share, and it's going to make it really easy for you if you're visiting the VGEmbassy.com webpage to like jump right off to the game page that we're talking about during the podcast and immediately mm-hmm. get in and start playing these games. It's, that's one of the really cool features about it. You don't have to download a ROM or go buy it in the store. You can just jump right in, start playing for free, and it's all completely legit and, and upfront. So right. uh, I really like that about it. Uh, speaking of which, the cartridges for these games are actual... Uh, PNG graphic files and it looks like a little cartridge with a, with a little label and it says the name and some little artwork but hidden within the code on these graphic files is the actual data for the game so you can download this portable network graphic image this ping file and you can run it you know you can put it in a folder on your Pico 8 installation and it plays the game and it, to, to the computer it just looks like a regular picture it's a really yeah. cool way to do it this is my, like, I'm living in the Matrix moment. When I saw that, I was like, just can't be right. <laughs> yeah. Surely, surely you jest. And, I mean, like, probably to someone who is more tech-savvy than I, this was like, oh, yeah, that's clever, but no big deal. But to me, I was just like, I'm playing a picture. A picture is a game. <laughs> yeah. And it's only a small part of the picture, too, which is right. even weirder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just very it's very clever. Yeah, it's only, what, 32 kilobytes each cartridge? Yeah, so each game right. is really small. And some of these games have a lot of content in them, too. Not not all of them, but some of them are extremely deep for 32 kilobytes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that brings us to the audio of the system, which is kind of like the meat and potatoes of our show today. Uh, So there's a sound editor built into the Pico 8, and it's basically a simplified tracker, more or less. Kind of similar to like LSDJ or Famit Tracker, but a little more streamlined and a little less feature-rich. There are 64 sound slots. Each sound can have up to 32 notes. So each sound is kind of like an instrument, I guess a different sound effect that the note can make. Uh, Each note can have its own frequency, volume, instrument, and effect. You can also change the speed of the entire sound, which affects how long each note lasts. There are 64 music pattern groupings, so that's like 64 patterns on a tracker, Mm -hmm. uh, and each track can play up to four sounds simultaneously, so it's a four-channel tracker. If you add a slow sound and a fast sound to a track, the fast sound will loop while the slow sound plays. So they don't necessarily all have to play at the same time in like 16th notes or whatever. Uh, When a track plays to its end, the Pico 8 will automatically continue to the next track and it'll keep playing. But you can change this behavior. You can make it loop. You can make it stop. You can set a loop point. So like on a Nintendo game, you can have a little bit of an intro for two or three patterns, go on with the song, and then have it loop back to the meat of the song instead of replaying the intro over again. So for composers that are familiar with how video game music works, this really has all the tools necessary to make some pretty cool music. And we're going to obviously hear that as we go throughout the show. Yeah. From reading about it, it's more restrictive in the sense that you have to operate from the Pico 8 machine to be making your music. Whereas for the graphics, you can just sort of import an image Mm. sheet and just cut it up however you want it. But uh, from what I read and have seen from playing around with it a little bit, it's kind of nice to use for being so simple. And obviously, as we're going to hear throughout the show, people have done some pretty cool things with it. Yeah, I think as far as, you know, consoles go, a good frame of reference in terms of sound would be like a Game Gear or mm-hmm. like a ZX Spectrum. It's got kind of like a, you know, limited channel, three or four waveforms playing at a time uh, with, with some extra enhancements as far as instruments and sounds go so you'll hear some instruments on these channels that you probably wouldn't hear on like a a game gear or a sega master system for instance and i think some of the uh some of the musicians and composers are a little bit better at sort of creating those sounds i guess it's sort Mm -hmm. of more of like a sound design versus composition you know comparison you can get a little bit more out of your music when you're better able to create those instruments and voices and whatever you want to call it Yeah, if you want to spend the time to really kind of get in there deep and and create your own palette of sound, yeah, you're going to have a better sounding product for sure. So why don't you talk a little bit about the graphics, Mr. Pixel Artist? Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> so the big takeaway is it's 16 colors and it's on a 128 by 128 pixel display. And Ed graciously put up some comparisons to other systems uh, for reference. The Game Boy Color has a 160 by 144 pixel resolution and it has 32,000 different colors that are displayable, um, only 56 of which can be done simultaneously. And the Game Gear is 160 by 144 with a 4,096 color palette, 32 colors on screen at once. So, you know, it's it's less powerful than those machines, uh, intentionally so, but it does have advantages over things like the NES that had in the C64, which had really restrictive, uh, you know, the amount of colors that you could fit in a cell or a, you know, a, a range of pixels. It, it was very restrictive, but in the Pico 8, you got 16 colors, put them where you want them. You're just limited in how much you can fit in and how much you can have on the screen at one time. Yeah. I think there were some sprite limitations on the Game Boy Color and Game Gear that the Pico 8 doesn't really have to worry about either you can have many more moving parts on yeah, the screen at once yeah you have uh pico 8 has uh, 128 8 by 8 sprites and then there's another 128 that overlap on the bottom half of the map data which is it's sort of like a 256 sprite sheet that you can work with you don't need to devote all of them to sprites but you can just basically a picture a 128 by 128 image and that is what you have to work with as far as uh, graphics in a game. That's cool. The sprites and tiles sort of interchangeable and you can decide what you want to use for graphics uh, I mean, what you want to use for sprites and what you want to use for, for uh, backgrounds. Okay, okay. So you could have a really large object kind of behave like a sprite even though it might be the size of a background sure yeah kind of yeah okay okay which was not something that you could really do on the game boy color and there are there are talented coders that do polygon games and things like that that i'm you know the, the, all the, the coding stuff is beyond me I, I don't have the experience for that kind of thing but um yeah people are able to do a lot with what is a on its face a pretty restrictive bit of hardware yeah, there are some really good 3D games on this, and I'm not even sure that the Beco 8 was designed to be able to do them, and people just kind of figured it out, but yeah. um, there's definitely really smooth uh, polygonal games. I've seen some games that are similar to, like, Rad Racer, but mm -hmm. they've got, like, really nice hills that go up and down and really smooth scrolling, you know, back and forth corners and stuff, so... Uh, it might not be the resolution and the amount of colors that, like, the Game Boy Color had, but it feels like it moves things around more like a Game Boy Advance might, but with a more limited palette and a more limited resolution. Yeah, that sounds about right. Like, you're not, it's not really chugging along. It's it's pretty smooth. It's pretty, yeah. pretty powerful for what it is. Absolutely. All right, so anything else you want to talk about before we get into the music? No, I mean, I think, I think we've covered covered the gist of it i i would just you know before we get into it once again recommend that anyone who's interested go check out the games and if you don't want to download the pico 8 itself some of these people do have them as standalone games that you can get too so don't hold yourself back go support these people that's true yeah you can either go to the website and play everything on the on a web browser for free or if you want a standalone pico 8 plus the ability to have a little more freedom with developing uh, i think it's like 15 dollars to own the system lifetime so and then you can get a standalone executable mm -hmm. and you can run it on anything you want basically like raspberry pi android uh windows or mac i think yeah. it comes on natively but then other people have ported it to other platforms as well which is pretty cool there was a a pocket chip it was called that's basically a not quite a i don't think it's a chiclet keyboard but one of those like bubble keyboard it, it was just a keyboard with like a very small display and it ran pico 8 and let you code on the go and play games that's cool and it was really cool but they stopped stopped selling it i don't think it was official through lexoff oh that's a bummer get one second hand make your own yeah exactly put it together i know you can with the raspberry pi you can make portable units yeah as well so you can yeah. turn that into a a Pico 8 really easily. All right, so let's get into our music. What you got for us first, sir? Oh, music? We're playing music on this show? Yeah, no, we have once in a while we do that. Okay. All right, so first up, I have the gameplay theme from a game called The Slow and the Curious, 
It was uh, released in 2016, and the composer slash game maker is someone known as Emu. All right, we'll be right back. Once again, that was the gameplay theme from the game The Slow and the Curious, coming out in 2016 by Emu. What did you think of that one, Ed? I didn't think of it until you said it, but when you said Mega Man, I absolutely heard it in this tune, and I was like, I can't believe I didn't hear it to begin with. But it's a really energetic piece. It feels very video gamey. I think this was a great track to start off the show with because... It's a good introduction to uh, how the Pico 8 can make really traditional sounding video game music. Agreed. And not everybody does that. There's a lot of people out there who really do like demo scene style music, Mm -hmm. which I'm excited to share in the show as well. Um, But what what drew you to this one in particular? Well, I think it is, like you said, this is a more traditional video game music sounding track. And as we get into the show, that is sort of few and far between and um i love Mega Man music and to me this felt like just a pure love letter to you know Mega Man's two and three and um the game itself is barely a game at all and it's it uses music sort of tongue-in-cheek almost because it's this rocking driving galloping song and the game is a i guess you'd call it an endless runner yeah but it is just the slowest possible pace and it's extremely (laughs) easy and in his description for the game he has something to the extent of it's just you play until you get too bored to play and you get so bored you die yeah you basically kill yourself you're you're a sloth on a road that's scrolling from left to right and you, uh, there are obstacles on the road, but you're going so slow that you're <laughs> mm-hmm. never, ever going to hit any of these obstacles uh, accidentally. Right. So while you've got this bumping music going on, which is actually, this is a relatively long track for a Pico 8 tune as well. It's about right. a minute and 40 seconds. Uh, if you wait long enough, you're rewarded with that kind of bumping little drum and bass, yeah. like dubstep mm-hmm. thing at the end, right before the loop, which was really cool. But this little sloth just kind of crawls along, and he's just... Uh, does the day... Li- it, like, turns from day to night. Like, there's there's some... Yes, there's the day-night cycle. So there's... I mean, there's some death to it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, he... Uh, the creator... It's one, one person did the music and the graphics and code and everything. In his post for the game has some, obviously kidding kind of more of the tongue-in-cheek oh yeah we gotta we gotta read this yeah, where you talking about the day night cycle do you have it open yeah it says uh the features include uh, and then he's got some bullet points a bump in soundtrack uh-huh. freakishly lifelike <laughs> graphics and freakishly is italicized uh-huh. a cute little sloth guy relatively breakneck speeds which is a lie uh, an innovative day night system <laughs> a vast array of seven different obstacles, seven different obstacles as italicized, and 
puns. And at the bottom it says, the point of this game is to see how long you can play before killing yourself out of boredom. Uh -huh. And I don't know whether he means killing yourself IRL or killing your sloth. Because <laughs> I think either is perfectly possible. Yeah. I, when I was playing it, I, I started turning it into see how close I can get to the obstacle without hitting it. Ah. And that was how I injected a little bit more. I ratcheted up the excitement. Hitbox experimentation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very good, very good. So, while this is a great example of Pico 8 music, it might not be exactly a good example of Pico 8 gameplay. While I wouldn't call the game fun, I will say that it does give <laughs> an idea of what you can accomplish with it. Yes. Because while, while he is goofing around and doing a day-night cycle in, you know, this Endless Runner, it still is something that is, you know, needs to be coded and it was done well. And if you play the game, like it achieves the effect very seamlessly and it's appealing to look at graphics and everything. In a way, this is the perfect intro to the Pico 8, not because it is fun, but because it gives you an idea of what you could do. Right, right. And when you've got a bunch of developers that just come out of nowhere and can develop something for free, you're going to get really weird experimental stuff like this. And that's kind of like the heart and soul of, you know, the, the Pico 8 game library, is that people aren't making games to make money. They're making games because this is a weird idea they had, and there's literally nobody that's going to tell them no. Right. So right. follow it through. <laughs> yeah. And they're just sort of like, it's almost like the speedrunner mentality where you're just tapping at the corners of what you can do to see where you can find the cracks yeah. and see where it lets you go. Exactly. Exactly. So let's move on to something a little bit more traditional for my first pick. We're going to play the level theme from a game called Super Contra Hot. And this was developed and written by an individual by the name of Picoter8. And this was released last year in 2019. Let's hit it. That was the level theme from Super Contra Hot by Picoter 8, released last year, 2019. Uh, as I was saying to you, Ben, as we were listening to this, I feel like this kind of sits maybe a little bit between VGM and Demo Scene. It's got... Mm -hmm. I feel like the beginning with those little decrescendos, like it feels a little bit more like a Game Boy, Game Boy Color game, but then it gets a little bit more... I guess modern sounding in a sense with some of those like staccato notes which feels a little more demo scene but all the way through I really enjoyed this track it's just a, it's a short 30 second loop but it does some really cool stuff in those quick 30 seconds what were your impressions yeah I think that's a good way of describing it and what you had said earlier in the show about kind of sounding a bit feeling a bit like a ZX Spectrum really jumped out at me with this track I mentioned earlier to you as well that I hadn't listened to any of your songs before uh, unless I had heard them previously mm. just enough to know that they ran on my computer okay so I'm kind of <laughs> in this journey with the uh, with the rest of the Fiji Embassy listeners as a bona fide scener I don't mean to toot my own horn but I'm, I'm very famous now <laughs> I have an entry on you know on Demo Zoo so that's true and uh, I think I do too actually for uh impulse project so we are we are both famous in the demo scene together mm -hmm. yep. so we are experts on the pico 8 has your check come in yet uh we were getting paid yeah yeah it's uh oh. i usually bring it on the back of a truck because it's so big <laughs> <laughs> so, many, so many zeros it just falls right off yeah, the yeah. Uh, end of the end of yeah. the paper there there's just a pool of zeros in my driveway i'll be on the lookout for that <laughs> <laughs> we're getting paid in all the profits from uh, the Pico 8 developers, what, yeah. how much money they make, right? Yeah. So it's like 
two million times zero. Mm-hmm. Um, but Super Contra Hot is a really, really cool game. It looks like a Game Boy game. So it's using basically four shades of black and white. Mm-hmm. You get a very monochrome screen. There's a very simple little sprite as your dude. And it's a side-scrolling run-and-gun, but they took inspiration from the game Super Hot, where time slows down if you're not moving. So you can kind of plan your next move. You can just run through the game if you want, like a normal run and gun. Uh, it, it's extremely hard to do it that way, but when you take your hands off the controls, you'll see things go down to like probably like one frame per second. And so your sprite's aiming is kind of a full circle. If you think of like a, a game like Midnight Resistance or Akari Warriors or something, uh-huh. you can fire in a full 360 all the way around you. So it gives you time to kind of spin your gun around while you're stopped and time is slow so that you can aim at different enemies and you get kind of almost like a Mad Max Matrix kind of feel where you're going in like bullet time in and out of these slow motion sequences while you're setting up your aim for the next enemy that you're gonna shoot so it's really cool it's fun it is hard it's it's a we didn't mention this before but the way the control is set up is like an NES controller so you get a uh, you know directional pad and then a uh, an X. They call it an X and a Z button because when you're playing on a keyboard, it maps to Z and X. But you can use a regular Xbox controller, and you can use the you know the Y, the B, or the A buttons to press press those buttons. Uh, so you got one jump button, one fire button, and then you'll use the directional pad to kind of circle around. So it can get tricky at times. But I really kind of enjoyed this game. I, I haven't beaten it yet, but I feel like it's one of those games that I I, I will be rewarded by getting better right. at it. Yeah, I haven't I haven't played it yet, but I I will. I'm going to check out the ones that I have not played on this list and you see. Should, you should. I, f- I feel like this is a game that someone like uh, Dan Lawton would enjoy, like yeah. somebody who really likes speed running. Um, it might be fun to kind of on the Discord uh, post screenshots of the scores for these various games that do re- you know have scores in them to see if we can compete against who's the best. I'm going to have the top score on uh, the slow and the curious. You just let it let it like run while you're at work one day. Yeah, I've been playing this entire time. That's how easy it is. <laughs> I just check back in every couple minutes and dodge. <laughs> just find a sweet spot where it can't uh-huh. get hit and then just let it go for like 48 right. hours straight. Like they used to do in Pong when they needed to go and get more beer. They would just <laughs> set up the paddle so it was in a, in a perfect loop and then they would leave and come back. Exactly. So uh, Picoter 8 has made two games for the Pico 8 system. Uh, Super Contra Hot, and then he's got another one called Atomic Punch Man, where you can punch your way through 32 levels of intense airborne action, (laughs) and you have to clear all the enemies on the screen without ever touching the floor. So that sounds pretty fun. I haven't checked it out yet, but it sounds like something that I would probably enjoy. For this particular game, he said he had plans to make more levels, but he ran out of time, and he wants to make more in the future. And that's another cool thing about the Pico 8, is that once you publish a game, it's not necessarily done. Right. You can get feedback from people. Like you said, it's kind of like a forum setup, so you'll have lots of commenters on the bottom saying, I love your game, or I found a bug, or this is unplayable, fix this right, and this right. and this. Yep. And so you can actually go back, recode, retweak, and then uh, it's it stays on the same link. You don't have to make another version of the game when you update it. It just... Mm-hmm automatically repopulates with your with your fixes yeah um so every game is technically a work in progress unless you literally say on the description this game is done i'm not working on it anymore mm-hmm. you know and you will see sometimes they will have the older versions preserved for i'm not sure why but you will see like a version 1.2 underneath the version one like embedded in the thread of the form but mm. yeah it's just uh it's right there you just click on it and then you have the latest version of the game and it's, it's all golden pretty user friendly they really yeah. kind of like thought of everything when they put this together i yeah. think and I, I would just say this game when you mentioned the grayscale graphics it does a really nice job of doing the background effects in kind mm. of that softer colors it's a it's a very for being a black and white game it's very appealing it looks a little foggy in the background yeah 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 yeah, yeah it's cool all right, well, that's all I've got for that one, sir. What you got next? All right, let's consult this magical list here. <clears throat> next up is maybe my sleeper pick for best game on Pico 8. <laughs> it is, again, gameplay theme. And may- maybe now is a, actually an okay to time to mention that most of these songs are not named. So I think you and I have just been 
calling it gameplay theme if it's from a game or menu theme if it's from a menu. Kind of harkening back to like the Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum games. Like you'll get a, a title theme and a gameplay theme and really that's all you get for your games. Right. It's very sim- similar for this because right. we're working with size constraints so you really can't put a whole nine track OST on your on your cartridge there. Exactly. So anyway, this is gameplay theme from the game Alfonso's Bowling Challenge. Uh, the game is made by Kitten Master, aka Andrew Anderson, and it came out in 2019. Love this game. We'll be right back. That was gameplay theme from Alfonso's Bowling Challenge, uh, written, composed by Kitten Master, aka Andrew Anderson, and it came out in 2019. What did you think, Ed? Oh, I love this game, man. I'm so glad you showed me this one. It has a great bowling feel to the music, first off. It's got a very kind of a loungy, much more of that demo scene feel. You're starting to hear those arpeggios and a lot of those effects that you'll hear more on demos. But I feel like this track really matches the action of the game and that it's a little bit lighthearted. Right. It's got a little bit of enthusiasm to it. It just <laughs> feels really cheesy, but really well produced at the same time, which is, I think fits exactly what this game is all about. Yeah, this is goofy. It's um, silly. It's, it's called Alfonso's bowling challenge, but I would call it more of a, it's closer to like a pinball game that, just breaks the fourth wall and sort of... It's like half pinball, half pachinko. Yeah. (laughs) It's got a lot of different things going for it. Right, yeah. It's mostly like... (laughs) It's it's a vessel for silly jokes and weird subversions of expectations and... Yeah. uh, It's just... It's a good experience. It's a short short game. It's only maybe like 15 minutes long or something. I, I highly recommend it. It is a delight. Yeah, I, I don't think you can actually like lose or anything. So so what happens is you see a, it's like a top down view of a bowling alley in front of you, a, or a bowling lane, and then there's two sets of bowling chairs, like you know, like those chairs that are all attached together on one on either side of the screen, and your bowling ball just kind of drops. And you're like, oh, how do I get this bowling ball to go and meet the pins? And then the seats start going up and down, kind of alternatively. And so you realize you control the ball itself, and you have to get the ball to get onto the chairs, and the chairs will kind of lift the ball up the side of the screen, and then you can launch it off the side of the screen to drop down in the middle to knock the pins over. And you basically have unlimited tries to try to figure it out. The, the physics on the ball are fantastic. It feels real. It feels easy to control. And then once you knock all 10 balls down, Alonzo will come on and be like, oh, a strike. You did it. You're the best. And yeah. then weirder and weirder stuff will start happening. And you have to use the bowling ball to kind of knock very strange. I don't want to spoil anything, but it's like it's very absurdist humor. Yeah. Presented in a very kind of friendly and playable fashion. And I think it's not necessarily as much of a game as it is kind of an experience, but it's an experience that you should absolutely experience yourself. Right. And for the price of free, like you can't go wrong with it. Yeah. Even if you had to pay 10 bucks for this, I'd still recommend this one. It's the walking simulator bowling simulator. <laughs> Alonzo's walking bowling simulator. Yeah. Perfect. And ev- every frame is sort of like a new slice of the pie. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Have you played any other Kitten Master games? 
I have, although... Let me see. Let me pull up his page real quick to see if I can tell you any of them. Because I think him and I want to say his girlfriend or possibly wife have done a couple of interesting things. Ghost House, I think it was called. It's sort of like a Maniac Mansion game, I want to say. That's cool. That was done for one of the one of the game jams. Game jams is a very popular thing with Pico 8. You, for those who aren't familiar, you'll have some set amount of time, usually the weekend, to churn out a game. Uh, usually there's a theme, and they do a lot of them on Pico 8. Yeah, that's very demo scene style stuff. They also had a uh, Christmas advent calendar where yes. you, uh, mm-hmm. they released a new, like, professionally, not, well, a new well made game, uh, I think, leading up to the 12 days of Christmas or something like that. They were kind of official releases. So there's some good stuff. Uh, they like to keep their uh, audience kind of uh, entertained with official releases and such. Oh, yeah, there's Ghost House. And he did it for the uh, spooky September four color jam. So he had to make a game using only four colors. Um, And his wife did all the background art. Yeah, cool. There you go. Very, very cool. As if 16 colors wasn't uh, restricted enough. Let's go ahead and chop that in in a quarter. Use one fourth of what's available. There you go. But you know, as evidenced by Pico 8, the restrictions breed creativity. So um, I'm... As my wife would say, I'm here for it. <laughs> oh, I think my wife says the same thing. Ready to move on to our next one? I'm ready. All right. I'm excited about this one because this one is probably my favorite game that I've played so far on the console. <gasps> this is the gameplay theme from a game called X Zero. And no, it's not an F Zero clone. Uh, <laughs> this is from Paranoid Cactus, and this was released uh, not too long ago, the end of 2019. Let's hit it. Alright boys and girls, we're back. That was the gameplay theme from X Zero, released by Paranoid Cactus for the Pico 8 in 2019. And I like to call this song like the Metroidvania song, because in my opinion, uh, it feels very Metroid at the beginning, with some very kind of spooky, lonely keyboards, some very elongated notes with little twinkly arps in the background. And then once that kind of uh, B section kicks in where it pumps up a little bit. I get a very Castlevania, more maybe more Castlevania 2 vibe than anything else. Mm-hmm. So you kind of squish them together and you got your own little Metroidvania sandwich. Uh, I, and I, I really like it. I, this feels just very VGM to me. It doesn't really have any sort of demo scene quality whatsoever. And it really fits the like genre of game that it belongs to, which I'll get into in a second. But before that, Ben, what's your opinion of this little ditty here? Well, I am uh, I'm a sucker for anything that's going to be harkening back to the NES, mm. and this again did a really good job of sort of I- embodying that spirit. And I think you're right about the Castlevania Metroid mashup. I uh, I mentioned I got a little hints of maybe like Splatterhouse or some other horror game at the very beginning, mm-hmm. but then it quickly breaks out into that triumphant Ganbare. I definitely can agree there too. There's a lot of VGM inspiration. I feel like this game is 
one of the most solid productions on the Pico 8. I guess it was last updated. Uh, it was released in 2019, but last updated January 11th of 2020. It's a side-scrolling shooter very similar to, I guess, Turrican. I, I guess that's kind of the best. You have, you've played this one, right? Help me out here. Um, I played it in a sea of games, so it's not standing out in my memory. Okay. okay. I thought it, I thought it was a side-scrolling shooter when, when we were talking about it, but I could be conflating it easily with another game yeah it's a it's a run and gun where you start off in this cave okay the whole game takes place in this cave and you have a uh, a map that draws as you travel throughout the level and there are red dots all over the map and you basically have to figure out how to get to these red dots which are these terminals once you get to the terminals you hold down on the directional button you quote unquote hack the terminal uh and the screen gets a little distorted while you're doing it as you go through the map, you have to hack them all. And once you've hacked them all, the gate to the final boss at the end of the game uh, opens up. And yeah. then there's this giant full screen boss that you've got to defeat. But on the way there, there are two different kinds of enemies. There are these kind of flying fly-like creatures. And there are these kind of walking aardvark-like creatures. And they appear in pretty heavy numbers. Uh, some of them can drop health, and some of them can drop weapon power-ups, so you can uh, fire in six different directions, but you can also get a gun power-up, which will change your uh, single shot into a three-way spread shot, and then into, like, a, I think it's a seven-way spread shot, which is really powerful. But when you get hit, you lose one of those power-ups, you go back down to three or back down to one, depending on where you're at. So you really kind of have to keep yourself alive and keep your power-ups going because by the end of the game your single shot is not going to do it right you're going to need to like shower these enemies with bullets in order to to make sure that nothing hits you i i played all the way to the boss i have not beaten the boss yet it's a decently long game i think it'll give you a good 15 to 20 minutes of entertainment even if you know the best way through the maze and so there's a decent amount of challenge once you some sometimes you have to go through a a section of a maze to get to a couple of terminals and then backtrack and after a while the enemies that you've beaten will respawn so you'll find yourself going through these empty corridors and being like oh no big deal at all and then boom little clouds will appear and they'll all kind of pop back up and you've got to beat them all over again yeah. so they you know made sure that you experience a challenge all the way through it yeah this is uh, sounding more familiar so uh, you're you play as a little blue kind of mega man doom marine halo hybrid kind of guy yeah exactly less cartoony like mega man but more like a like a turrican right. or a contra yeah, yeah, yeah. looking kind of dude um very simple graphics but i just i just think the gameplay is extremely solid uh very easy to control anybody who loves uh run and gun games i think will have a really good time playing this one uh paranoid cactus's little blurb he put at the bottom of the game says, uh, this is my attempt at making a polished game in a week and a half, although it ended up being two weeks. I had to drop a few features I wanted to put in due to time, and the code ended up getting a bit messy. Still, I'm pretty happy with how it came out. So, uh, to put a game like this together in a week and a half to two weeks is pretty damn impressive <laughs> to me, man. It's just rude. These rude people <laughs> doing this. <laughs> Uh, and Paranoid Cactus has a lot of games out, too. He's got one yeah. called Lava Joe. Uh, that was his most recent one. He did a cover of two Castlevania songs. So he covered Vampire mm -hmm. Killer and Heart of Fire using the Pico 8 music system, which is pretty cool. Which which I, I guess, you know, so the, the B part of this music that we're listening to right now is that Castlevania inspiration is not a coincidence right. at all. Yeah. Uh, and then he's got a couple tutorials, like how to do polygons, how to draw, you know, smooth moving polygons, a couple of other shooters like Shadows of Dunwich, Shadows of Dunwich 2. Those are actually on my uh, honorable mentions for games that are really, really good, but don't have very good music. Oh, cool. Uh, Shadows of Dunwich is a really cool, it's like a tactical RPG, which to put together in Pico 8 is just one of those kind of mind-bending things for me. Yeah, yeah. And then he also made Pico Tennis 2, which is the first game I ever played on the Pico 8 and was really impressive and kind of like got me interested in playing more games on the system. So yeah. uh, again, not a lot of music in it, but just a very smooth, just a very polished 
simple little tennis game、mm-hmm. that would be a lot of fun for for multiple players、right. to play. So one one thing before we move on from X Zero, I wanted to point out that it has a really cool like splash screen.、Mm. It's got cover art, and going back to how we talk about how limited the graphics are, that's probably large part why the level. Art is、uh, relatively simple, is because he spent such a huge part of his graphics budget on the intro screen itself. He doesn't have a whole lot more to work with. Yeah, but I think he handles it really well. I don't think it feels boring. It's just like a very efficient use of tiles and things like that. Sometimes you just need to、uh, put all your plumage up front、yeah. to attract.、Yeah. The locals, exactly. <laughs> I'm always p- plumaging real locals, <laughs> exactly. So,、uh, boys and girls listening, if you are interested in getting into the Pico Eight,、uh, this might be a good place to start looking through Paranoid Cactus's collection because、yeah. I think you'll run into a couple of very different and very well-made titles to enjoy and kind of get a good example of what a very talented coder. Can do with this little fantasy console that we're featuring today. Yeah, I second that. Talent, very talented. Yeah, absolutely.、Uh, speaking of talented, we got some talented composer or a talented composer coming up next. What you got for us? From the、uh, world famous, well, <laughs> soon maybe soon to be world famous. Coming up, it's the level theme from the game Omega Enforcer X. The game itself was made by someone named Vitali Beard. Dinsky came out in 2017, and the the music is composed by Chris Donnelly, who goes by the handle Gruber Music. Cool. Let's give it a listen. <laughs> Right, that was the level theme from the game Omega Enforcer X, composed by Chris Donnelly, aka Gruber Music. What did you think of that one, Ed? This one is glitchy and funky, and extremely unique. And as a individual who appreciates kind of experimental, quirky, like Aphex Twin style music, this struck a chord. With me, I imagine that it's very difficult to create music like this in a tracker, where things want to snap into place and be kind of evenly quantized, and to make it sound like it's broken or trying to,、uh, like I think I told you while we we're listening to it, like the like that that B section where it gets a little bit more lighter and twinkly, it almost feels like it's not confident. Enough to be a song, and it's trying to be the song,、yeah. but it's like stuttering over itself. Like、right. that was just a really cool. I have no idea what it's doing in a shmup like Omega Enforcer X, but I feel on its own, it's a really, really cool piece of music, and I really like listening to it. Yeah, I mean,、uh, the music is pretty unfitting for the gameplay,、mm. and I have a theory about that.、Uh, Gruber Music, Chris Donnelly, does a ton of music for. These games, and I think he may just offer up 
music to developers who are looking for someone or possibly he just has there's some posts on the forum of people offering up like bits and bobs of code or music or whatever mm. to you know incorporate into your games and also he releases these jukebox carts which are you know between one and ten songs it's not a game you just kind of shuffle through the songs and listen to them and in fact i think one of the games that you picked from is actually a track from one of his jukebox carts so i think he's a as prolific a composer you can be in pico 8 i think is chris donnelly yeah and that really harkens back to the demo scene as well like music discs and yeah, yeah. just compilations of of music and it's true. A lot of those uh, demo scene, like Commodore 64 and Amiga music discs, you would see that music reused in other demos. You would mm-hmm. see it reused in other amateur games. So this is almost exactly following right. this kind yeah. of uh, scene mentality right here, which is really cool. I mean, it's just, it, it fills my heart with joy that there's like this little pocket demo scene going on around this fantasy console. And it. I, I've looked through these forums. I've looked through the, the comments. I've studied individual people and their games, and I have never seen anybody be rude to anybody. I've never seen anybody name call. It just seems like a really positive community and a lot of people who are just there to help each other get better at making really cool games. And I love that so much about this. Yeah, I was reading someone was saying how and I think it was maybe a blog post or something, how how they didn't expect the Pico 8 to be that difficult to reverse engineer or just basically come out with like a free version of it. But because it is so much beloved by the scene, no one has done that because they don't want to take away <laughs> this like this funding for this company because they all love it so much. They're like, no, no, we're yeah. not doing that. Can't touch that. No, I mean, I mean, right. And they're already offering it for free anyways. Like what? what how would that even make any sense to offer something else? And charge for it to make a profit. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So tell me a little bit about this game. It is a, it's it's not my cup of tea. It's just a, like, it's a polished, pretty looking top down shooter, but I'm not much for that kind of game. Mm. It's got nice graphics. The music, like I said, is good, but doesn't seem like it really fits the game. There's some interesting power ups, but basically what you'd expect from space shooter as a as a fan of shooters myself maybe i appreciated it a little bit more there's some there are some really cool particle effects like whenever you shoot uh-huh. there's like a little like comedy trail behind your bullet uh as well as the bullets that the enemies are shooting whenever you destroy an enemy the screen like shakes yeah. and flashes there's like yeah. a lot of really intense kind of almost feels like when you hit somebody with a power move in battle toads or something there's a really kind of thick thud sound mm-hmm. and the screen shakes like you're rocking back and forth with the explosion of the ship that you just caused. There's excellent polish all over the game. Yeah, yeah. It's a simple game with really cool effects, and it's the effects that kind of keep you interested in it, Yeah, I think. Uh, And this is an endless game as well. In the description, it says there's endless waves of aliens and asteroids, and you're basically competing to be the first place on the game's leaderboard, which we didn't really even talk that much about the online capabilities of the Pico 8 itself because when you're browsing for these games and going through these game lists it's all within the pico 8 ui so you're browsing these games within the console downloading it within the console playing it within the console so that also allows for online leaderboards and some other interaction with other i don't think it really does like online multiplayer but i do think that these games have the capability to kind of upload scores right and such so that you can kind of compete against each other within the community, which is pretty cool. Yeah. You don't see that on the Game Boy Color. But nobody's going to care once they see the Discord VG Embassy leaderboard, because that's going to be where you have to be. That's where you show off your skills. Oh, yeah. For sure. I mean, this is a game that I think this one, and uh, it would be cool to see, like, uh, I think Contra Hot are the two games so far that would uh, be the most appropriate for a high score getting, in my opinion. Yeah. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll, if there's enough interest, maybe we can make a sub forum on the, uh, <laughs> on the Discord server just for uh, Pico 8 players. That would be a lot of fun. It's just going to be Dan Lawton. He's like, I spent 36 hours and now I have untouchable high <laughs> scores in every single game. <laughs> he's going to be, he's going to be recording a podcast and it's going to be him. You can hear him 
typing buttons in the background. Oh, just got another new, new high score. Another high score. Oh, yeah. Anyway, about kids. He can he can cheer us all on too. Yeah. Because he's really positive about that. That's anyway, right. So. I say this with love and and only the slightest. He's like, I got fifty million, but really good job on your thirty-two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he really does appreciate. You it. know, you could uh, you could get a couple more million if you'd stop sucking so bad. No, I don't <laughs> think Dan would ever say that. No. No. <laughs> nope. He's he's one of my best friends and he was he's just such a positive guy when it comes to that stuff. And he's not he's not egotistical about his stupid amazing game skills, which is awesome about yeah. him too. So I think we can all agree. A A plus guy. Yes. Dan Lon. Look him up. <laughs> For sure. Give him a virtual hug. Streaming every night on Twitch. <laughs> now he has to do it because I said it. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> gotcha. Love you, Dan. Anyways, let's move on to our next one. Uh, I kind of put these two next to each other in the list because they are very similar to each other, and I will divulge why when we talk about the game itself. This is the level theme from Attack of the Green Blobs from Chow Yunbrint. This came out in 2020. We'll be right back. That was the level theme from Attack of the Green Blobs by Chow Yun Brent, a.k.a. Dan Howard. This was released February 28th, 2020, so not that long ago. And it's a really simple piece, but it's really super catchy. One of the reasons I picked this one is because this game is essentially a tutorial on how to code games Mm -hmm. for the Pico 8. So this is the culmination of an article that Dan Howard wrote creating this game from scratch. So if you follow his tutorials from start to finish, you will end up with this game and you will end up with this piece of music as well. So it's really cool that uh, somebody's taking the time to really sit down and like kind of guide like literally handhold people through the process of starting to create for the Pico 8. And if there's anyone out there who is kind of like a budding coder or just wants to learn how to create, I wanted to put this in the show so I could link you directly to this game so that you can kind of just dive in with somebody who's an expert and a really good writer and can just kind of uh, start learning what you need to do to to start making some cool games. But that being said, I really like this track. It's very, very simple. It reminds me of like an earlier kind of Game Boy or a Game Gear game. Really simple bass line with, with drums. And of course, I love bass and drum grooves. But then that little very demo scene style lead keyboard comes in. And I think, Ben, you were talking about how you really enjoyed those kind of like note bends and they felt really kind of organic. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other thoughts you had about the music? Well, actually, before we get too far field i don't want to forget for tutorials there's also a really excellent youtube series by lazy game devs there are two of them one is a breakout clone and it's by the guy is christian something but lazy game devs is the channel cool and they also have a couple of really good games up on pico 8 one is a puzzle game called like my's hotcakes or something and then there's the the breakout clone which is called pixel break and if you're not if you're not so much into the reading and you just want to watch your tutorials, highly recommend it. That's cool. Yeah, if you can find that link, maybe we can put it in our show notes. So the, I will. Uh, don't let me forget, because otherwise I will. I will remind you. Okay. I'll hack into your phone and set it on your calendar or something. Okay. Do that. Yeah. Your phone runs Pico 8, right? Yeah. Yeah. I have a <laughs> I have one of the Pico phones. There you go. Uh, I have a Pico phone 8 plus. Right. 
16 colors of Facebook looks great on it, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, you were saying about the music. Uh, I like it. It's kind of, uh, it's almost like almost bluesy at parts where it's mm. kind of, this has something about the, the way it, it moves that kind of gives, it evokes some of that for me. Um, it's kind of happy and peppy. Once, once I looked at the title screen for this game, I know I've poked around at it, but I don't remember the gameplay at all. Probably it seems like another one that's maybe not super fitting for a shooter, but... Yeah, it, it's really similar to Omega Enforcer X, which is kind of why I mm-hmm. wanted to put them together. It's a, it's a vertically scrolling space shooter. It's an infinite scroller. Uh, the reason it's called Attack of the Green Blobs is because, you know, he just made some very simple sprites for your player ship to kind of shoot at. But it has very similar styled like particle effects and kind of a, a loud thumping explosion whenever you defeat one of the green blobs. Uh-huh. So the games felt very, very similar to each other. And I was wondering if he even took some inspiration from Omega Enforcer X uh, and just kind of coded his own game kind of using Omega Enforcer X as a, as a template of sorts. Uh, so I wanted to kind of put them back to back so... Uh, if you're playing along with us and kind of clicking on these links as we're going through the show, you can kind of compare the two games and see how similar they are to each other. Not not in terms of music at all. I think the musical selections for both of these games are extremely different. This one's very kind of simple and very by the books video game music, while, you know, Chris Donnelly's score was a little <laughs> off the books, <laughs> more right. or less, under the table. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, very simple game. Uh, I just, like I said, wanted to share because it had some really, really nice tutorials, which kind of takes you underneath the hood of of the Pico 8 if you're interested in that kind of thing, which I know some of our listeners are. So I hope that maybe you can uh, use and utilize those tutorials if you're interested in them. And now that I've seen what people can do in a week and a half, I expect your listeners to make something... uh, Absolute perfection. Yeah. Yes. And hey, if you need any graphics... Come see me. I'm in Discord. Go hop on there and ask me to draw you something. That would be awesome. I am a testament to your talent because I have a little pixel face. Actually, all the pixel art on my website is from you. All of our uh, staff page lovely facades are all <laughs> dyad originals. So That's right. And that, that reminds me, you know, you can do something as simple as this, but then a team of coders also recreated in 60 frames per second virtual racing on the Pico 8. Mm-hmm. And it looks amazing. It's a fully 3D polygonal game with music and sound effects and everything. And it controls just like the original arcade game. So right. uh, there's the sky's the limit when it comes to the Pico 8, I guess. Anything yeah. you want to do, you can do. You just have to... Sometimes you have to be a little more tricky with the coding than, than others. Right. So... And we kind of talked about the, you know, the general demo scene vibes that a lot of this stuff has, and maybe the demo scene culture that Pico 8 has, but I don't know that we've said outright that there actually is a few Pico 8 demos for the demo scene that are out there. So Mm -hmm. if you want to see people pushing the hardware to, you know, just for the sake of seeing what they can do, there are some really good ones out there. And, you know, it's, it's going to be typically focusing on the visuals and the sound when you're looking at a demo. So you can get some really impressive stuff that way, too. For sure. And, and I know that, you know, we had a little discussion before we even recorded this show about whether or not to include some demo scene style stuff. And I wanted to hold off because if and when Impulse Project does come back, I was really looking forward to kind of doing a Pico 8 show on there and sharing the demo scene side of this console. But if that doesn't come to fruition for some reason, then maybe we can come back and visit the demo scene side of the Pico 8 on, on VG Embassy. So either way, you guys will get some tasty morsels of Pico 8 demos. It's what the people demand. I'm demanding it of myself, so I have to listen to myself. I'm my biggest <laughs> critic. So, <laughs> All right, Sarah, what do we got coming up next? So coming up next, we have the gameplay theme from the game Katamari Christmassy, which came out in 2019. And the music was by Matt Westcott, or Gas Manic. Thank you. 
right, welcome back. That was the intro theme followed by the gameplay theme from the game Katamari Christmassy. It came out in 2019 and the music was composed by Matt Westcott, a.k.a. Gasmanic. Well, Ed, what did you think? I really appreciated this one. I was actually going to put it in the show myself and then I saw that you did, so I was super happy about that. As a huge Katamari fan, uh, I really appreciated how accurately they recreated the music for a uh, sim- you know simple square wave music chip mm-hmm. and then combined it with popular Christmas themes like both pieces have their own kind of I think the first one is uh, God bless you Mary gentlemen the other one goes into like rocking around the Christmas tree right. and how they blend the Katamari themes into the Christmas themes is really creative really kind of brings home the theme of Katamari to this game, which, I, as we were talking about, is, is kind of like a demake of the original Katamari Damacy. Yeah, I um, I don't know if this is part of the game jam or if it was just a release sort of around Christmas, but um, I knew that I had to pick this one because I knew that you're a super fan, and I also love the Katamari franchise, so it's it's my, my chocolate and my peanut butter here. <laughs> I won't say that it's like a faithful recreation of Katamari, because you can't really do that, but it, it's an isometric tank-controlling version of it that is still definitely maintains the spirit of the game, and I think it does it in a very fun way. Yeah, so you get kind of like a flat plane that you're looking at on the screen. You're rolling your ball around and I guess the king or somebody is like throwing items onto the the screen. And just like Katamari, you have to pick up items that are within your size scope to successfully attach them to your ball. So your ball gets bigger and you can get bigger and bigger stuff as you go. And if you accidentally run into something that's too big for you to pick up, you'll lose a little bit of size. And the screen's got this really weird kind of... Uh, like almost like a VCR, like scratching kind of an effect and the music gets all warbly and stuff. So that was Mm -hmm. kind of a neat special effect they added uh, to the game whenever you do something wrong. The only thing that's too big for me to pick up are my britches. Ooh, you got to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Wait, I guess I'm too big for my britches. Let me rethink that. Your britches could be too big. We'll we'll, we'll polish it and we'll bring it out for, uh, you know, Pico 8 part two. (laughs) You're too big for your balls. That's right. They keep yeah, growing, there we but go. I, it's still too big. <laughs> and then they turn, then they get turned into stars, just like in real life. Ah, uh, or star dust, unfortunately. Ooh. Ouch. Oh, no. Anyways. Yikes. <laughs> let's get away from that conversation and uh, <laughs> talk about this game a little bit. I, you know, I was, I was really impressed by it. There's some... It feels like Katamari. I think they really captured the kind of weird, wacky but also playful spirit of the game. Yeah. And it's quite colorful. There's uses of like negative space in the background and stuff to make it feel like things are a little more complex than uh, you're really like seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, So the guys that did this had a really good handle on on the art and how to work really well with just a limited color palette. Right. And again, going back to the limited, you know, amount of sprites you can use because Katamari is a game about for those of you who don't know you pick up a bunch of ordinary objects in your ball that you're rolling gets bigger and bigger so you you, by nature of the game need to have several different objects of different sizes to Mm. pick up to increase your ball and they did a good job of doing they do some like scaling of the sprites and things like that to yeah actually make this game function it's uh, very clever really well done and they recreated, so the Kings got this really kind of uh, holier-than-thou, very regal kind of dialogue in the original <laughs> yeah. games, and they, they recreated that quite well in this one, too, depending on whether you uh, failed or succeeded at mm-hmm. your task of making a Katamari as big as the King demands uh, at the start of the game. So, yeah, it's fun. Recommend. I appreciate you uh, recommending this one, because I didn't even know this one existed until you linked me to it, and I was like, oh, dude, this is choice, so... Works it's out well. Tied, tied you and me over until the Katamari episode. Yes. Oh, that would be a good one, man. I didn't even think about that. I'll add that to the list before someone else gets dibs. So throw it on the Discord. So this game was programmed by a gentleman known as P01. And my next pick is also from the same programmer as well. So we're going to listen to the gameplay theme from Dirt Racing or Dirt Asterisk 
racing if you want to be pedantic about it. This one came out in 2019 as well. Let's take a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the gameplay theme from Dirt Racing, developed by PO1 Music by Chris Donnelly, a.k.a. Gruber Music, who you might remember from Omega Enforcer X and many other Pico 8 titles. And I think this music has that kind of recognizable Chris Donnelly sound. Uh, It's got that very kind of, uh, it's just a little quirky and a little off-putting. And a, just just enough of it to make you very interested in it, which I really kind of appreciate. Uh, it's a very simple track, and the reason being is because this dirt racing game was part of a 17-in-1 jam, which means they attempted to fit 17 games into one Pico 8 cartridge of 32 kilobytes in size. So things needed to be very simple and very kind of quick and dirty so uh it's a little tiny loop but i thought it was just a really kind of fun interesting little piece of music what'd you think of it yeah i like this track i had heard it uh, i mentioned when we were listening to the track this is one of the songs that is on chris donnelly's jukebox one of his jukebox tracks so i was familiar Mm -hmm. with that's the only reason i recognized it when i heard it and this in like there's a there's a puzzle theme i was mentioning gets used in a lot of games and i think that probably that is the case because these are some of his more catchy tracks yeah it's hard for the music to fit with a game when it's not designed for the game but i think this is a good job of having this kind of peppy happy jumping around chris donnelly popcorn glitch music and it (laughs) works with the motocross or whatever the hell the game is yeah it's like four by four racing kind of a deal yeah and uh i also think that when you're doing a game jam you're going to kind of want music that's already been produced because you don't want to spend half of your game jam time yeah trying to come up with a tune to write and then actually have to program a game as right. well so you may as well have that code ready and just kind of plug it in there yeah dirt racing it's fun it's it's got a neat little premise to it it looks kind of like uh I guess uh, RC program. If you could fit the entire track onto one screen, and you race around it, and then as soon as you do a full lap and cross the finish line, a ghost of your previous lap appears, and so your the object is to improve yourself every single time for three laps. So the ghost of your car will appear each time you cross the finish line, and your goal is to beat yourself and get three successive faster laps every single time. So it's a cool little concept for a very simple game. I thought it was pretty engaging because you kind of want to, I mean, you could kind of cheat and do like really crappy the first time and then a little bit better the second time and then, you know, go all out the third time. But if you really want to kind of improve yourself, it's a good way to see the exact copy and and not have to worry about programming ghosts or, you know, doing anything like that. It just kind of generates it for you. No sandbagging, Ed. No. Sandbagging is forbidden. You need to go all out. All out, all the time. 125%, three times in a row. As much as the normal constraints are 
daunting to think about. I can't imagine chopping that into one seventeenth. I mean, like, here you go. Make your game. I know. And, and and the tracks are cool. So there's a couple of different tracks and they have like topography to them. Like your it, your car just doesn't race around in mm-hmm. a flat. It it goes up and down bumps and it feels like it's a real kind of a, a off-road kind of a race with some really like interesting physics that feel kind of realistic. So I was really impressed by this for the sheer size of the of the game itself. So I'm not sure how he did it, but uh, this was kind of a, a cool little demonstration of how much you can do on the Pico 8 with a very little amount of space. I'm not sure if this is a naivete, uh, like a peek behind the curtain at how little is actually required to make a game, or if it is just a testament to these savants who are like basement coding whole games in you know 50 lines of text maybe both well under the features for this game poa lists it's got three in-game sound effects for the engine noises and transitions between tracks four music patterns mixing three unique sound effects five tracks ghost of your previous laps and a nice trophy at the end and a sweet easter egg and then at the bottom he says it was really fun to make my first game on pico 8 (laughs) so jerk Virgin coder uh, making cool stuff. So I don't know. Scrap this whole episode. I'm sick of these guys. Pico 8 sucks. We'll do the PS5 instead. Yeah. And the first comment was fun. I like the way the car looks when it rotates. And there's, yeah, some cool animations. So, and actually this really goes to show you how even from starting be- like very simple with his beginnings like this and then worked his way up to coding Katamari Christmassy all within the same year. Right. You know, that really goes to show you how you can even start off strong and then get even even better as as you go on with this little system. So I feel like we're ready for your last track of the evening, sir. Oh, what have you oh dear. What have you thrust upon us today? The end. The end is near. It's actually I think we're going for a three peat for Chris Donnelly here. This uh, comes from the game Alpine Alpaca. It's the gameplay theme. As I mentioned, it's composed by Chris Donnelly, and Johan Peets did the programming. Came out in 2019. Love this game. Be right back. Now that everyone is nice and relaxed, mm. let's come back from the gameplay theme from the game Alpine Alpaca, composed by Chris Donnelly. He sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. Are you nice and relaxed, Ed? I am, I am. For a game that features an alpaca sliding down a large wintry slope, this, this brought images of palm trees and Arnold palm trees to my, <laughs> to my brain. Little shout out to KVG on the wave there, but yeah, I uh, I enjoy this one. It does, like you said, have a little bit of the uh, Chris Donnelly stink on it. It's got some of those uh, just slightly, slightly glitchy kind of lead instrument, but this one's far more coherent, I think, than Omega Enforcer X. Doesn't mean I enjoy it any more or any less. I think it's a really good tune in its own right. Mm-hmm. Um, is that is that kind of why you picked it? Yeah, I think this is. 
my, maybe my favorite of Chris Donnelly's music that I've heard for Pico 8. Mm. I think it's just, uh, it has his fingerprints all over it, but I think it's a little bit of a departure from a lot of the other stuff, which is maybe more of a hard edge to it, more of a crunchy. This is more smooth and easy to listen to. It blends into the background. It's very good for a puzzle game, which this is. I mean, it's basically a puzzle game. You, you play as an alpaca who is skiing down a mountain and your uh, goal is to get through the gates. I don't know if there's an official name for the ski gates, if they're called something, but you envision sort of like a grid and you get a selection of three or maybe four cards, which... You start with three, but then you can get power-ups that give you more cards as you go. And yeah. the cards will allow you to move left diagonally, straight down or right diagonally for a number of tiles, one, two, or three. I don't know if they go beyond three or not. You pick card by card, trying to navigate your way around obstacles and through the gates. I'm not sure if I've done a great job explaining that, but... I think you have. Yeah, so if you want to kind of picture it in your head, you'll you'll see the alpaca kind of sliding down on the screen, and then he'll pause, and then three cards show up. And each time... You can move your cursor over the card and it will kind of show you on the screen where the alpaca will go. Right, yeah. And your object is to obviously guide him into each of these gates that you were just talking about. So if the gate is like, you know, diagonal down into your left and you select a card that's down diagonal to the right, he's obviously going to miss the gate. So you want to try to find a card that will at least set him up to be able to go into the right gate as he's sliding down. And sometimes you don't get the right card and you have to miss the gate. Or, you know, sometimes you will end up into a tree and there's not much else you can do. But as you go on, you get more power-ups. You can increase the number of cards you have to select from. You can increase the... Like, there's a... Every time you get a new level, there's a new buff that you can apply to your deck. Right. And so you can have, like, more straight-down cards. You can have... Uh, you can eliminate all your uh, one block moves and do only two and three block moves. So you can kind of customize your gameplay to your strengths as you're going down this hill. So it's a pretty deep game for something as simple as, you know, picking a couple cards just to get an alpaca through a ski gate. And and this music really helps, I think, because it kind of keeps you on a calm and thoughtful <laughs> <laughs> bent as you're as you're skiing down this slope. This this was one of my favorite games, I think, for the system that I played so far. Yeah, it's a well polished, simple enough concept, but done really well. I think that outside of the Sokuban games, there's not a ton of puzzle games out on Pico 8, which is sort of counterintuitive. But the ones that I've played are all really, really fun. Like I like Alpine Alpaca, I like my sweet buns or my sticky buns something like that which is kind of like a it's sort of like a matching game on a grid i don't know it's a little bit hard to explain but lots lots of just very very fun puzzle games when when you can find them they're they're good this console especially lends itself to cool puzzle games just because you don't need to have extremely high resolution graphics mm -hmm. or lots of colors to make an, a puzzle game because the fun is all in the gameplay and not necessarily the presentation. Right. Where that's a much bigger part of the package when you're trying to make an action game. Yeah. So. And the, the default controls of like playing on your phone or something are not super conducive to Twitch gaming. So the True. thoughtful, yeah. deliberate play of a puzzle game is works pretty well. Absolutely. And I feel like a verbal description of this game doesn't really demonstrate how much fun it is so this is one of the ones i definitely recommend you go check out and play for yourself if you're on the fence about whether or not it sounds fun right uh, and i think you'll enjoy it yeah for sure you'll enjoy it a lot seconded all right last track of the night oh no my pick is the level theme from which loves bullets this was developed by flytrap studios in 2019 and the music was composed by dustin van week be right back
All right, that was our last track of the evening. The level theme from Witch Loves Bullets, released by Flight Trap Studios in 2019, composed by Dustin Van Week. I guess what happened, according to the notes on the game's page, is that uh, Van Week wrote the music, but then Flight Trap Studios converted it to the Pico 8 music tracker. And so you're hearing an arrangement of his original music, which is cool. This kind of reminds me a little bit of, like, I guess, Ghouls and Ghosts or something. It's got kind of a spooky medieval... Mm -hmm. It's a 3-3 time, so kind of a very... I think you said it sounded kind of like Russian or... Mm -hmm. Fun little tune. Uh, It has a nice B section that's a little more wistful than the kind of militaristic A section. I don't know. Any other thoughts you had about it, Ben? No, I mean, I think... I think you've covered it. I was surprised how much I liked the way it sounded. I, uh, <laughs> this is not, not my cup of tea. Yeah, I normally don't listen to music like this either, but I just I felt like this was very unique yeah. because I feel like a lot of the other composers are really going for action music uh-huh. or weird music right. or like very VGM style music, and this one really kind of fit a genre that doesn't normally appear on Pico 8 soundtracks. Yeah. And I, I really appreciated that it set the scene and it works with the game really well. Yeah. And um, kind of catchy. You get into the zone when you're shooting ghosts and frogs and all the enemies in this game. <laughs> and for a community where it seems like the music is not always kind of in sync with the gameplay, like you were talking about. We've got a lot of music from from Chris Donnelly here that was just kind of chosen for games, probably because the developers liked the way they sounded, but didn't necessarily match the gameplay that much. It's nice having a piece of music here that really does complement the gameplay and kind of enhance it. So, Witch Loves Bullets is a side-scrolling shooter, kind of similar to, like, uh, KO Flying Squadron or something of that ilk, where you're a witch on a broom shooting bullets that you also love, I guess. Um, but it's it's really well made. It's got very nice graphics. It's got parallax scrolling, tons of different enemies that all behave differently, mm-hmm. uh, four different, very large bosses that you can fight. So this feels like a very fleshed out Game Boy, Game Boy Advance quality, kind of retail quality title, I think is what I'm trying to get at that has a lot going for it and uh, has like multiple revisions too, so bug fixes and stuff, so they really worked really hard on getting this title to be uh, a very quality, very playable game. But Ed, how much could I expect to pay for such a title? I believe you could pay zero dot zero zero (laughs) dollars. I think I've got what the kids call vapors. (laughs) Falling off your chair, or you could pay $15 to get the standalone version, as well as thousands of other games. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But in the developer's description, Witch Loves Bullets is a side scrolling shoot 'em up containing four levels and boss battles. It features varied enemies, a couple of power ups, and parallax scrolling. Uh, in version 1.1, he added a score system with a combo multiplier, so defeating enemies in succession will grant you more points. So this might be another contender for the uh, for the VG Embassy Discord score challenge. Uh oh. Yeah, and uh, and Dan Lawton happens to love shooters, so I think he's going to destroy us on all of these. But Dan Lawton already holds the high score. We haven't even finished recording yet, and he's got the high score. <laughs> Damn it, Dan! And, and we can't Michael Jordan him. We can't. We can't put him out of the race just because he's good. So and watch, <laughs> no. he's he's gonna like have this some, some sort of weird like Pico Ada version where he's actually uh-huh. just terrible at all these games and he's yeah. not gonna be able to understand why. And it's gonna haunt him for the rest of his life. He's allergic to the thirteenth color in the palette. Yes. It gives him seizures or something. It makes a uh, makes his left eye twitch so he can't yeah. focus on the yeah. game properly. <laughs> Uh, but this game's got it's got multiple weapons too. So you got your normal shoot 'em up kind of shooty weapon, and then uh, your alternate weapon is kind of like a a forward a lob dropping bubble kind of a thing. Yeah, kind of like a like on Gradius or something like that. So really good stuff, man. This was this was a cool show. It ended up being really fun to kind of dive into this fantasy console, and it it's a lot more impressive than I originally imagined it was when I was first 
told about it. And I, I kind of expected some very simple games with not a lot of creativity and some right. very bleepy bloopy kind of music. Yeah. And uh, and I got a lot more than that. And there's a lot, obviously, a lot, lot more in the Pico 8 library that's worth playing that we just don't have time to touch on during this show. But Ben, you wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of other games that you really enjoyed playing. We're going to put them in the show notes, but maybe didn't have soundtracks that were really worth sharing on the show, right? Yeah, I wanted to, I got a, a handful of honorable mentions that I uh, I would have shoehorned in if I could have because I like the game so much, but it, it didn't have music that sort of held up on its own. Um, the first one is a game called Just One Boss, which is, you know, actually it is kind of like a puzzle game. You have like a grid and you move all around it and there are these obstacles that become increasing more difficult and it's just one boss fight. That's where the name Just One Boss comes from. Mm, cool. You have um, Curse of the Lich King, which is a technically impressive. The The programmer did like um, object source lighting and coded it all impressively. Shadows of Dunwich, I mentioned earlier, it's the tactical RPG, which is very impressive to me. It's fun. You sort of Almost like World War II guys fighting aliens. Well, that's cool. There's a uh, My Chan Sweet Buns, which I finally looked up the name of since I've mentioned it so many times on this episode. <laughs> and then the last one is a game called Rogress, which is a roguelike and Tetris combined. Oh yeah, that's right. You use Tetris-like gameplay to what's the name that there's the official name for what a Tetris piece is? What is it called? Tetramino. Tetramino? Or Tetramino. I don't know. People always say it. All right. Well, I'll say, t- I'll say Tetramino then to be um, contrarian. Yay. The the Tetraminos, each, <laughs> uh, you know, square of the Tetramino is a room of a dungeon. And as you build out the Tetris lines, it creates a dungeon for you to simultaneously navigate as a uh, little character in a roguelike, which is just a kind of... I can't. I don't know how someone came up with this idea. I think it's very brilliant, and it's it is uh, very fun to play. So the, there's a handful of games that will get you a couple hours of enjoyment minimum for uh, you know again that low low price of just just free. <laughs> yeah, that that Rogris was especially impressive to me because to a have a concept that's that kind of complicated uh-huh. and to choose to implement it on a very simple system like the Pico 8. Like, I can imagine somebody expanding upon that concept and really going wild with it as, like, just a regular indie game on Steam or, like, a PS4 title or something like that. And uh, and so maybe, hopefully, you know, it'll get some notoriety and they'll decide to to kind of expand upon it. But I would love to see... uh, I would love to see it get the Celeste treatment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, A couple games that I really enjoyed, there's one called Acceler 8, and the 8 is the number 8. Uh, it's kind of like a uh, Rad Racer clone, but like mm-hmm. I was saying before, it's got very, very smooth scrolling graphics, bouncy up and down hills, kind of like almost like Outrun, where you can kind of choose your difficulty level and then it kind of branches into other uh, themes as you go farther into the tracks. And good music, too. And very good music on that one. And what was the other one that I was thinking of? Oh, yeah, the Invincible Run Gun Bot, which is kind of a Metroidvania where you are an invincible robot that is also a shooty shooty gun bot (laughs) and you have to collect 128 glowing orbs around this gigantic map and kind of find your way through it and when you get hit it doesn't really kill you but it just kind of uh it weakens your weapon capabilities for a little while it makes it a little frustrating to kind of get through and you can't just like bump through enemies whenever you want to because you're invincible there's a lot of knockback so there are some enemies where you really have to figure out how to kill them instead of just kind of stomping over them uh so even though you're invincible it does it makes the game more of a puzzle game than it does in an action game although it's played like an action game so definitely one to check out there we'll have a whole bunch of games to share on the discord and we'll have all of these games that we talked about linked to on our show notes on the vgembassy.com i really do implore you guys to go check out some stuff, uh, share your own games 
with us on the Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash the VG Embassy or uh, even on Twitter at the VG Embassy or on Instagram at the VG Embassy or come over and visit our Discord and we can have some fun playing some cool Pico 8 games together. Ben, I'm sure you'll be hanging out in the Discord playing along with us, right? That's me. I'm there. I live there. Cool. (laughs) Thank you so much. This was a really good idea for a show. Uh, There's some really good music. I'm sorry that it took uh, almost 18 months to get around to finally doing it, but I feel like at this point, the Pico 8 has uh, developed enough. I think if we had done this show back when you originally suggested it, it wouldn't have the amount of quality music that we're experiencing right now. No, no, it would have been much more challenging. Yeah. This, it has time, had time to mature, and people are really flexing their muscles on the platform now, and there's some really, really just... Not not games that are good for being on Pico 8, just games that are good. So Good in general, Just to yeah. second what you said, I encourage everyone to just go check some stuff out. You can kill some time, have some really fun gaming experiences for just like a very minimal time investment. Absolutely. And uh, and no money investment whatsoever. That's right. Yes. So, uh, thank you so much, dude. I would love to have you back. You know, it would be fun to visit this same console, like a year from now and mm-hmm. just do like almost like annual updates about like maybe <laughs> what's come out in the past year and just kind of watch the console mature and watch you know these developers just become better and better at making some games and music and stuff yeah yeah well i'm uh, always a pleasure to be on thank you for having me and uh, you know whenever you need need that next pico 8 or any other episode i'm i'm only a discord call away we should do a diet challenge three soon I'm looking forward to those. Start working on my quiz questions just to be ready. Yeah, those are going to be fun. All right, dude. <laughs> so, as always, at the end of the show, I'd like to thank my Patreon patrons, and they go by the names of Cameron Shiles, a.k.a. Bruce Irons of the Mad Gear Band, Michael Bridgewater from the Forever Sound Version Podcast, Donovan Orofino, Chris Murray, and Bed Roth, RVGM series Chris Myers, John Jekyll, a.k.a. Mix Six Master, Ben the Diet Dishman Who? from the Diet Presents, a VGM podcast. What? There's a podcast by you somewhere in the ether? I haven't I seen know. it. <laughs> Chris Tienerson from the VG Jam podcast, Jordan Worma from the Table to Stage podcast, and David Parrish. Our audio attache members, Cameron Worma, Carlos from the Heroes 3 podcast, Scott McElhone, and Dan Lawton. Our special agents, Volt Supreme, Muddle Madness, and Ryan Steele. And as always, our VG ambassador, the patron saint of EGM Podcasts. Say it with me. Alex, the, the messenger, messenger. Messenger. Hallowed be thy name. <laughs> From the Messenger Presents, a VGM Journey podcast. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back in another two weeks with another awesome VG Embassy episode. Peace out. Or should I say Pico out. Picos out. Kikos, my Picos. Dotson. We got Dotson here. Ha <laughs> ha